Hey guys, welcome back to another review. We are on chapter 622 and we are still continuing with the flashbacks from last chapter. I think this time we are actually going to wrap them up and the next chapter we are going to see serious shit go down. So we continue from last chapter where Gasang and Enkidu were talking and Gasang is questioning Enkidu what he means by having his will overtaken by Traumarai, which uh, got Amyu's killed. So Enkidu pretty much falls asleep and a, a few moments later or i guess sometime later he wakes up and he like yells like an animal pretty much that's what gustang says so there's a few things uh that are kind of like odd here first of all traumarai said gustang you go kill enkidu i don't care what to do with him but like if gustang is in that office or in that room for a long time isn't traumarai gonna get suspicious that like hey it's taking a long time for you to kill enkidu is everything okay uh, that, I don't know, that's kind of odd. I think Traumarai would be suspicious. Traumarai is not dumb. He, he should have enough, like, uh, brains to know that something's up, that like Kasting uh, knows something, or Enkidu said something, or maybe Traumarai really has faith in his anima control ability. So what I think happened is that Traumarai just kind of like erased Enkidu's brain. Like, he made him revert into an animal, and like, for a brief segment, Enkidu kind of broke free and he was able to kind of relay his thoughts. That's why they were kind of like chopped up, but Enkidu no longer could resist his uh, his chains. So Traumarai just completely wiped him out to make sure he doesn't speak. But I guess over time, since Traumarai wasn't close to him anymore, like in, in that chamber where the great sprout was, Enkidu kind of regained his conscious and he was able to speak again. So yeah, a few oddities here. But I, I just don't see how Traumarai did not get suspicious of Gustang being in that room for so long. So everyone wanted to get rid of Enkidu except Gustang. And I'm surprised that nobody really questioned Gustang or got mad at him or kind of made him an enemy. And they kind of just like went with it and they didn't ask questions, especially Traumarai. I mean, Gustang didn't even ask him anything because like it's kind of it's kind of a big deal. And I don't think it's really in his interest to kind of provoke trauma about that or make him suspicious but like nobody really talked about it they just said okay well you want him imprisoned we'll imprison him and i mean that's what they did so this incident caused another terror in between these guys' relationships so some believed enkidu some didn't believe enkidu and like everybody pretty much is really against v and other people are not against v so we see that red guy uh, with the, all those eyes, we saw another chapter that was talking with Gassane, uh what's his name, Edwan, and I think Traumarai, and like, I guess they're enemies with him now. So, some of these people is like, they, they, they split up, and it looks like it's only the family leaders who kind of stuck together. So, I mean, this division, like, really separated the family leaders and the Towerborns, even the Towerborns who were close with them and who climbed the tower with them. There is now this huge division because of Amy Yuza's death. So this leaves Gustang perplexed. So Gustang's duty was to collect the truth and write it down in history and keep it intact. But with all that's happened, it makes it very hard to do that. And Gustang has to make a very tough decision. So even at this point, if he revealed the truth, I mean, nobody would really care because they are already, they're already at war and uh, they already have made enemies, like mortal enemies to the V, Arlene, and some of these Towerborns who were once their friends, but like turned on them recently. So Enkidu put a lot of doubt in Gustang's decision making. And I mean, it's really tough for him, like in, to be in his shoes, that like, he has a choice to make enemies with Traumarai, but that's gonna cause more problems and alleviate the problems that are already intact. There's a lot of things that Gustang really can't do because it's it's out of his control at this point. All these people are already mad. They're already at war. So he keeps like going back and forth, like writing the, the truth and then erasing it, writing a fabricated version of history. He doesn't really know what to do. So ultimately, Gustang decides to run away from that responsibility and just make fabricated stories. And this is probably the main reason why he considers himself a sinner and why he considers himself unworthy of seeing these memories because he basically went against his own purpose and character. So in the next few panels, we see like each of these family leaders disposing of their memories in their own unique ways. So we see Edwan kind of drinking his sorrows away. We see uh, 
Yeon Lee Rang, she kind of like, she's making a prayer or something and she's stashing these memories in this little like statue. I don't know what this really is. I, I think she's using her flames or something, her Eon flames to get rid of these memories and she's stashing them in this structure. We also see Gustang putting his enchanted book with the memories in his library. And last but not least, we finally see Leviathan. We only get one panel of Leviathan, but we see Tramurai torturing this poor Leviathan and stuffing him with his bad memories. I honestly would have liked to see more of Leviathan. I know it's not really about him, but I mean, he did kind of hype himself up saying that he used to rule the tower before the family leaders. And like, he's kind of like this godlike being that can only be, uh, that he can only contact like the regulars, right? Cause Bomb was the only one who was able to like kind of hear him in the suspendium along with the family leaders. So I kind of would have liked to see like what Leviathan is about but maybe we'll get some more uh, background information on Leviathan and see if he got any more memories that trauma I stuffed in him in the future. Cause I mean, Bomb still has them inside him. So they completely forgot about the vine and why it's still growing. But interestingly enough, they recall like the feeling of anger and sadness inside them, but they don't know the memories associated with that. So that's really interesting. They, they have the feeling, but they don't remember where that feeling came from. So. They have some memories that kind of like Tramurai, he kind of remembers Enkidu, but not really. And he keeps getting bothered by, by Enkidu and his nightmares. So Gustang says uh, after this point, after they dispatch their memories, he's been forced to write false stories. So yeah, this is where all these lies come from and all these fabricated stories because Gustang is writing off of ignorance at this point. He doesn't even know the truth himself because he stored it away. So from this point onward, Gustang has no idea what the fuck he's writing. He's just writing stuff that fits the narrative he wants to write. And he states he has a truth hidden in places he doesn't even remember. So maybe there's even more memories that Gustang doesn't recall, but he hid them so well, like he can't retrieve them. So like, what was the point of hiding them? Might as well delete them. Like, well, I guess the whole point was, was like, it wouldn't be tempting to like collect them again and you know, start a war between the families because ignorance keeps them in peace. Or maybe that's why he had Richmond kind of remember where that book was, like specifically Richmond was the only one who remembered. Well, I guess that girl too, that Pope and Out girl that originally found the book. I guess these are the only people who like were allowed to know because Gustang, like he didn't want to know the location. So that makes a little more sense, I guess. But I mean, still, he's trusting like a regular, I guess, like that girl, I don't know who the fuck she was. She knew where the book was um, and they killed her anyway. So, I mean, there's kind of a flaw there. You, you're gonna trust someone and know where the book is, but you're gonna kill them afterwards. I still, I don't really know what that was about. Anyway, that's not really important because we resume into the present and we go back to Enkidu and Bellrire. So Enkidu and Bellrire, they're kind of like talking to each other in the same body. And I'm surprised Enkidu like stayed with Bellrire's body because his body kind of fucking sucks. What happened to Goro's body, by the way? Did he just absorb it? Is it part of his power? Or did he just like dispatch it? I don't, I don't know what Enkidu does at these bodies, man. What the fuck? So it looks like Tiara is indeed permanently dead unless Gustang like does his little scripture magic and puts her back into text kind of like Richmond but I mean we don't see her at all and Bellarier got away with his arms being attached back to his body so it's like nothing happened to Bellarier so Bellarier informs Enkidu of the present events and what happened with like all this time Enkidu has been asleep and Enkidu learns that these guys became official family leaders and they are pretty much gods of the tower and that like nobody can see them except some of their direct descendants. So that's interesting and I guess like back then they were barely starting their families but they were still just barely becoming the kings of the tower. So Enkidu doesn't know whether to feel annoyed or excited that he can actually get his revenge on these pieces of shit family leaders. And we also see Enkidu is back to his full body. I don't know if this is like his spirit. It looks like it's, it's a spirit, right? But I mean, I don't know. <sighs> this is confusing. It, can Enkidu morph into his original body again? Or is he just stuck in Bellarire's body? Like is Bellarire his new host? Like is that his new permanent body? Can, does he only own one body at a time and whatever that body is he has to stay with it because he has his youth back he has his original full body back i, I think it's a spirit but 
you never know with Enkidu. This guy is like kind of an enigma. So what I'm thinking is that Enkidu is letting Balrier be his vessel and he's letting him control his own body while Enkidu is like, you know, he takes over. Like he has, he has, uh, he gives Balrier his blessings of being immortal pretty much to anyone except the family leaders and being able to kill people like at his discretion. So they also talk about these new people that they want to become the new 10 great family leaders. And these people are actually looking up to Enkidu to stand a chance against the family leaders. I guess because of his blessings and his history and knowledge, all those aspects make Enkidu a valuable ally and a pivotal ally to conquering the seat of the Ten Great Family Heads. So Enkidu is optimistic about the future events and he's clearly out for blood. He wants to get his revenge for being stuck in that fucking chamber for thousands of years and being wrongfully imprisoned and just for these guys, these irresponsible family leaders to get rid of their memories and not take accountability for their wrongdoings. So this scene ends off with Balrier. I guess Balrier is controlling his body and Enkidu is like taking the form of a spirit. I don't think he'll regain his youth back. I think at this point he's just gonna have to keep hopping from body to body as they get destroyed or until he finds a very strong vessel. But I guess we just see Enkidu's like original spirit the way he originally looked and he's just gonna be like kind of giving Balrier his blessings and take over when it's necessary or whenever he wants because I mean he already won. He he already took over Balrier's body. So we cut into my least favorite scene of this chapter and it is in Dorsey. Of course in Dorsey she's just camping at this point. She's hiding and she gets busted. So yeah I was like well why couldn't Tramurai or any of these high rankers send to Dorsey? I mean, she's a regular. I'm pretty sure she's not really that stealthy. She doesn't have as nearly as much skill as these guys to hide her Shinzu or whatever. So it only makes sense that she gets busted. And that she does because Tramurai's frog, the one that lies to Gustain, comes out of nowhere. So this random frog, uh, it grew so big, by the way, it finds her and it alerts Tramurai of her presence. Tramurai tells Holan that they already found the king and Holan is just quick on these actions. He automatically just starts running and he turns into fucking Kaneki with a centipede Shinzu and he tries to capture Endorsey and he fails the first time because she uses Bong Bong. So this, this is kind of a nitpick. I'll get into it right now, but she tries to use Bong Bong again as she sees Tramurai eye to eye and she can't because Tramurai is using Cobalt to block Bong Bong's telepathy. So I do not like this. Call it a nitpick, but I don't think Endorsey's Bong Bong should require a fucking family leader's anima to not work. It should not work in Tramurai's presence at all. Like the, the, the gap in power and abilities are so large and Bong Bong is a D rank weapon, by the way. This is a, such a low rank weapon and it's still getting her out of these situations. It's kind of bullshit. Like, come on. Like, that's that's getting ridiculous at this point. So Holan finally manages to do something right and he captures Endorsey and he's really serious about it. This guy is like trying his hardest. He's giving it 110% to capture this weak little regular. And Holan and Tramar are about to strip her of her king. So that is where this scene ends. So... I really had no problem except with that bong bong thing, uh, but that's pretty much all I gotta say for this scene. So the next and final scene for this chapter is Gustang and Dumas and Bomb. So I think we are finally done with the flashbacks, like 100% this time. And Gustang tells Dumas to keep an eye on the irregular. So. Gustang wants Dumas to just watch this guy, not let him escape, I guess guard him. I think he just doesn't want him to escape because a regular is still a valuable asset. And Gustang says these few words. I'll meet with Tramurai and kill Tramurai. Man, I was so fucking hyped when I read this. I was like, man, Gustang is gonna blast through this fucking sprout and kill Tramurai. Finally, something is gonna happen. They're gonna get into a big fight and Gustang is gonna use a bracelet to kill him. However, I do not think these family leaders will die, at least not so easily. We still have to worry about Urek coming in to ruin everything and just put his ignorant opinion in here and fuck everything up. 
Urek has no idea what is going on. He doesn't know these memories. He's ignorant, but he's just still gonna butt in and stop these guys from fighting to the death. What I think is gonna happen is Gustang is gonna get Tramurai to his last breath and Urek is gonna butt in this fight and stop him. So it's gonna be like Urek has no idea what's going on. He has no idea what Tramurai did, but he sees Gustang beating his fucking ass and almost killing him and he drags Gustang out of the battle and saves Tramurai. And this is gonna piss a lot of people off, including me, because that's fucking bullshit. Urek, goddammit, I'm gonna be so pissed if Urek does this because it's like if I'm in a fight with someone that just stole my fucking wallet, I chase after him i pull his shirt back and i start beating the shit out of him and then these fucking people the witnesses the bystanders they pull me back and they all tackle me down but the guy stole my wallet why can't i, I fight him and get my shit back and then the guy ends up running away in my wallet and gets all my money and i end up in fucking jail I guarantee you something like that is gonna happen because Gustang is already on the wish list to die. Jihad already wants him to die. And I mean, if he fails in killing Traumarai, he's gonna make mortal enemies with Traumarai and all these family leaders. And Jihad is gonna be on his case 110%. I mean, whether Gustang succeeds in killing Traumarai or not, he's gonna be enemies with these family leaders because now he's attempting to kill them. So, I mean, the only good thing that if he kills Traumarai is that that's one less person they gotta worry about but still i mean we're talking about traumarai he is a family leader so killing him is gonna cause an enormous disturbance amongst all these family leaders and jihad like that is unacceptable to them i really hope luzik pulls in first of all i hope he saves bomb from dumas well i'll get into what i think what's gonna happen with dumas right now but I hope Luzik pulls in, he kind of like distracts Urek, he uses all these spells, he puts Urek in a dimension where he cannot escape for a brief moment of time, like he's stuck in there for maybe an hour, and he just lets, he lets these guys fight, because that's what, that's what Luzik wants, he wants these guys to fucking die, I mean that's what Fug wants, and it's in his worst interest to have Urek stop them, like god damn it man, Urek, dude, what he does, he hasn't done anything all this time. But now he wants to butt in at the most crucial time when he's done nothing to prevent this from happening in the first place or try to, to alleviate any of this tension or anything, bro. He just butts in, puts his two cents, doesn't care what anyone thinks, and he thinks he's in the right. So just be prepared for that um, when this happens. I don't even know if we're going to have a chess match at this point. Uh, cause maybe Gustang is just gonna go straight into fighting Traumarai and doesn't give a fuck about the game at all. Actually, he can't do that cause this is already set by the administrator, so they can't really break the administrator's vow anymore. So they might still have to continue with this game. But we'll see because we've seen things derail before and completely change direction. So regarding Baum and Dumas, I think when Baum wakes up, he is going to be enraged and he is going to charge at Dumas and try to kill him. Because remember, the last thing Baum saw was his friends being killed right in front of him by Dumas. And he was already getting emotional, he was already getting broken. If Dumas didn't play around with him a little more, he probably would have awakened his power and given him a proper fight. But I mean, Dumas ended the battle really quickly, put him to sleep, and now they are here. So yeah, that's what I think is going to happen. Bomb is going to fight Dumas. He is going to get emotional. He is not going to care if uh, Kastang is out there to kill Traumarai. He, his, he just saw his friends die. He just saw his closest friends die. I mean, at least Kuhn died. He was in disbelief. We don't know. Uh, I think no, Rock is alive because Dumas purposely kept him alive. But Bomb is going to be overwhelmed by emotions and he is going to charge at Dumas. So I don't know if they are like allies or like neutral. I don't know what Gustang plans to do with Bomb. I think he just wants to keep him captive, but Bomb is going to want to fight and he is going to want to save his friends. And that is what's going to happen between Bomb and Dumas. So we're going to get a rematch. Maybe this time Bomb will use his full power and he will properly kill Dumas or... I mean, it's already been hinted, kind of like foreshadowed, that if they break Dumas's core, he will never wake up again. So we'll see what happens. We'll see if Kuhn is alive still, or if Bomb is going to have to use his revival magic to bring him back to life. Maybe use that in conjunction with the Firefish. I don't know, but I am pretty sure a fight is going to break out between these two. And the last thing I want to discuss is Gustang's perplexed situation with Enkidu and a family leader. So 
why does Gustang want to kill Traumarai? It's not like Traumarai did something personal to him. I think it has a lot to do with kind of like the ramifications uh, of Traumarai's actions and realizing that Traumarai has been kind of like pulling the strings behind the background, behind the scenes, I should say, with Jihad. So maybe this is why N got locked up because Traumarai and Jihad, they're working very close together behind everyone's back to kind of like get their way. So Jihad and Traumarai, this is the thing I want to talk about. Jihad and Traumarai, they are working together to influence the decisions and the thinking of all the family leaders. So Traumarai himself, he can't really like tell people things like get his way that easily. But with the backup of Jihad, I mean, he's a king of the tower. Of course, the family leaders are gonna respect him a little more than Traumarai. So with two great warriors sticking together, especially the king of the tower, I think Traumarai is able to easily sway their opinions and their actions towards his favor. Same with Jihad. This is ultimately working in Jihad's favor because he wants to remain king. He wants to remain ruling the tower without anyone rebelling against him. And if he can keep these guys segregated and kind of like against these people, but like not against him, that works out for his favor. So at first I thought Gustain was acting out of like justice, that Traumarai deserves to get justice served to him for all his wrongdoings. But I thought deeper about it and I really do think it has to do with like all the things that have happened all these years with Traumarai and Jihad kind of manipulating everybody into stashing their memories away and having them forget convenient and important information that makes them look bad. I mean, the end situation was one of them. Maybe there are some things that didn't make sense to go staying, like, hey, how can we trap my daughter? But since he stashed away his memories, he can't really put the things together. But now with this book, it all makes sense and it clicks now. So he wants to serve the proper punishment to these fuckers for doing all this stuff, manipulating the family leaders and getting their way with them. In other words, Gustang wants to put an end to Jihad's lies and his manipulation. And he is pissed off that he's been being deceived and just tricked all this time. So overall, this was a pretty solid chapter. It's just wrapping things up. So in the next chapter, we're gonna see some real shit happen. We're gonna see what Gustang does, if he's just gonna fly towards Traumarai and start beating his ass, or if they're actually gonna progress to the game. We're gonna see what Bomb does with Dumas. Is he just gonna bow down to him, kinda? Or is he gonna try fighting him out of anger? We're probably gonna see Enkidu meet up with Rachel, and Rachel and Enkidu are gonna conspire some shit. They're gonna link up and like Bella Ryder's there too. So like all three of these guys, they're gonna conspire some stuff. And I think they're gonna meet up with the boss and his allies and they're gonna wipe out all the forces there. And Kudu might try to possess Lobodon. He might try to possess Prowse. This guy is broken. This guy has broken abilities, man. And could you, like what kind of administrator allowed this thing to exist? He has so many broken abilities, man. How is he allowed to coexist with normal people in this tower? Oh, before I end this chapter, I have one more thing. I have one more theory that I was thinking about. I gotta start writing these things down because I forget. I almost forgot to include this in the review. So obviously, Traumarai can control Enkidu, right? So I think Enkidu's main problem is being able to be controlled. Like he can't really defend himself against being controlled by Traumarai. I mean, that's a huge problem for all these guys. So what I think is gonna happen is Enkidu is going to possess Yama or try to possess Yama because Yama has all the things. So he should be immune to Traumarai's control. And he also has information about the hybrid and you know, all that stuff to avoid being controlled by Traumarai. So I think Yama is the next target for Enkidu to get and this will be a huge benefit because the last thing he wants to do is be controlled by Traumarai. He can still be killed by him, but not controlled. It will only make sense because that's Enkidu's main weakness right now. Like he has all these abilities to kill people and to not be killed by people, but he can still be controlled by Traumarai. So that is his main problem. So possessing Yama will patch that uh, weakness and it will pretty much make him invincible unless he runs into a family leader. So this sounds probable, but Yama, like he just got a power up. So it wouldn't make sense for him to be killed right away and ridden off. But I mean, we just saw Tiara die. 
like six chapters ago so it's not too far of a stretch but yeah that's all i gotta say for this chapter and let me know what you guys think let me know what you think of my theory with yama and what you think of gustang now officially going to kill traumarai and what you think of endorsey being captured i think she's going to be saved by gustang because i mean how else is she going to get out and what do you think is going to happen between dumas and bomb i think they're going to fight I think Bomb is not going to be able to control his anger and he's just going to wake up and fight Dumas. With all that said, thank you so much for watching everyone and I will see you in the next review.